All right, here we are, chapter 10, the last lecture for CIS 244. Well, <laughs> part one, the last part one of CIS 244. We're going to talk about system architecture. So we're going to bring it all together here. We're going to talk about where it is, how it is that we're going to design our system, where it's going to live, essentially. So checklist for issues to consider when selecting a system architecture. You know, is this going to be web based? Is this going to be in house? You know, trace the evolution of the system, explain client server architecture. We're going to do all this stuff. We've pretty much come, go ahead and pause, look at this. You know, web 2.0, I would say we're on like web 5.0, you know, the version of the web. Great things still happening with the web. We see a lot of standardization. We see, uh, you know, that uh, Google just recently said, hey, no more support of Flash in our browser, uh, it's gonna be HTML5 to stay alive, basically. Um, so we need to understand that. Now, some of this information you should have already have gotten in the CIS 179 Network Essentials class, the idea of you know, what the heck a bus, a ring, a star, a mesh model are. You know, today we're pretty much you know, full mesh. We've gotten away from hubs, we've gone to switches. We're in wireless. We're currently a meshed, no pun intended, in wireless. We no longer connect our computers. That's where the connectivity is. We have wireless speeds that are exceeding those of wires, you know, until you get to gigabit. And then depending on who you ask, if you go by the theoretical model of 802.11ac, you're getting gigabit connectivity, uh, but not necessarily actual connectivity. So let's look at architectures. We've talked about an ERP system and enterprise resource planning. The idea that it's a single database, a single system, corporation-wide, organization-wide, etc. You know, when you talk about corporations and organizations, we, we have to discuss and consider culture. Is this a culture that is embracing technology and utilizing technology? Is it an industry that's utilizing technology? Does management support moving traditional uh, physical business processes into logical processes that are handled by databases and web-based interfaces? Total cost of ownership. We've talked enough about that for sure. It's definitely key. It's how we understand how much the system really is going to cost, not just the tangible costs that are easy to find, what the licenses is, how much the server is going to be, but what it costs to back it up and improve it and support it and maintain it and, you know, produce a new report, all of that stuff. System works. It should be scalable. Do we integrate the web? It really depends. Remember, we can, again, use web technologies that never leave our organization that never leave the boundaries of our network, for example. So web may be the way to go. Legacy system interface requirements. So are we linking to a legacy system? On campus here, we have Banner. It tends to be somewhat of a legacy system. We've created a lot of links in and out to get data in and out of Banner so that we have sort of that single repository, but there's information spread all over that needs to be pulled for you know things like uh, financial aid and uh, grad tracks and other things that go on. Security issues, processing options, corporate portals, you name it, it's all included in that checklist. So organization and culture, just a little bit more about these things, you know, must perform well in a company's organization and culture. Again, if the culture is not technology focused, it's going to be very difficult to get technology to be leveraged to its fullest ability inside the company. I think we've talked enough about ERP throughout. Um, you know, just go do more research, understand what SAP is, what Microsoft Dynamics is, that it's an ERP system. You'll see it sold in modules so that these companies can sell you a small part of the bigger solution. Eventually, though, unifying all of the modules into a single unified database. So total cost of ownership, yep, tangible purchases, fees, contracts, hard costs. Then we look at soft costs, we look at support, we look at troubleshooting, we look at downtime. Let's not forget downtime. Is this a system that we need to build in a redundant hardware environment so that it's going to stand the test of a hardware failure? 
scalability, web integration, you know, legacy systems. So go ahead and pause, read a little bit more about this. You know, scalability, by the way, this is one of the reasons why we're going to the web and why more applications are being put in the web so that we can dynamically pull and utilize hardware resources, processing, memory, et cetera, during, say, peak business times, but not be paying for it the rest of the year. So if, if we do 80% of our business online via sales at Christmas time, we may need a system that supports us for, say, 60 to 90 days during that, that holiday season. But the rest of the time, our system can run on, you know, one fourth of the resources that it needs during that peak period. So by putting it in the cloud, hosting it with someone else, we can quickly call in, get more resources when we need. It can actually dynamically scale. So as the system determines or detects more orders, more things are happening, it goes out and gets more resources. Processing options. So, you know, will, will data be available online? Will we batch process? We might still use some file processing too and, and do that in batches. Security, security, security. What can I say? There's whole classes on IT security. The Security Plus exam is a great course to take and uh, garner that certification. It's not just about securing the data, folks. It's about securing the hardware. It's about securing the premises. Every way that a hacker can gain access to the data. Because the fact is, if a computer is stolen, I have all the time in the world to try to hack into that computer and get the data off. If a computer that is stolen and, say, has the technology, if it's connected to the web to wipe it, or better yet, the whole drive is encrypted, I know my data is much safer. So corporate portals, portals provide access for customers, employees, suppliers, and the public. You can think of uh, your Bobcat system on campus as a portal. You can go in there and look at your financial aid information. You can change your, your information. You can register for classes, drop classes, look at your transcripts. That's a customer portal for you as it pertains to the business of education. So system architecture then and now. <clears throat> well, every business information system must carry out three functions. Manage applications, handle data storage, provide an interface that allows users to interact with the system. Pretty simple. So if you think about everything from an email system, it does all of these things. Pretty simple, in fact. Um, but every system must do these things. Now, how it does it is two different things. So sort of the old traditional way, we had a mainframe computer, all the processing power, all the memory, everything we did was back here, and we worked on dumb terminals. These terminals had no processors. They were just input and output devices, um, you know, before mice even, before pointing devices, before graphical user interfaces. Um, you know, these were not GUI-based. These were command-based. So we would type in a command and get back information or type in a command and store data back on the computer. So, you know, highly efficient. And what's funny is as we look at this and as we go through this, here we get the impact of the personal computer where data was now stored locally on the personal computer. It was processed on the personal computer and we started utilizing those personal computers into business. So whereas the mainframe could have been inefficient, we now had independent computers on the desktop that people could um, write information to, store information, ask information, you know, more specific to their job function, not have to wait around for the mainframe computer to be available. And this is when we started opening up the idea of having client server based networks. Okay, so um, you should probably have this information by now. You should know what a local area network is, what a wide area network is. So local area network would be the, the Bend campus Okay, so the Bend campus, but we're connected to the Redmond campus. That creates over a WAN link, a wide area network link, high speed link between the two campuses, between Madras, connecting Prineville. This gives us a wide area network that allows us to share data across these regions, whether it be a corporation, educational institute, 
etc. So again, sort of back to the client, as we started working more, having more processing power, more memory, independent operating systems on the client, we started saving more data back on servers that was presented, maybe even in a lot of cases processed by the client, then stored back on the server. So email would be an example of this. And we created client server applications. So in the case of Microsoft email, we would have a server called an exchange server. It exchanged information with a client called Outlook, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. And what happened was you would install Outlook, you would configure it to talk with your email server, and you could get mail, send and receive mail back and forth that you created on the client, store it on the server. Then here came the evolution back to the web. Our local client becomes a web-based interface, most likely Internet Explorer. Um, that has a web-based interface, like I said, that sits right here, sort of a middleware, probably on another server called a web server that communicates with the Exchange server and gives you a web interface that has your emails, your calendars, your contacts, etc. So client server designs, you know, from a client server, very flexible, from a mainframe, pretty rigid as to what we could do. Uh, application development exploded when we went to client server because mainframes were very specific as to how they would be programmed, what their functionality was, what they could do. So you can see and compare the rest of these, the advantages of client server. Now what we've done though is we've brought it back and said, well, wait a minute, we weren't using our server architecture as much. We're going to the web. There's an idea of having all the data back centrally located so that we don't have data on clients that might disappear, uh, that might become infected, that might be easier to hack. We'll just present the data to clients, to users, when they need it. So two types of clients, a fat client and a thin, Okay, also called a thick client, locates all of most application processing logic at the client. So this would be the idea that the processing, that maybe even some of the storage is at the client, whereas a thin client locates most of the processing logic back on the server. So all we're basically getting with a thin client is IO, input output, where the data is processed. We input data, it goes back to the server, it's processed, it's stored, we ask information of it that then is presented back out to us. So there's really the difference between a fat and a thin client. So client server designs, you know, a uh, fat client, network traffic is very high because we have a lot of data that's going back and forth between the client and the server. Whereas a thin client, again, it's just input output, okay? So a fat client uh, would might be information, I'll give you an example, an Excel spreadsheet that might link to a database. There's a lot of information that's going to be passed back and forth versus getting just an interface that interfaces like Outlook, um, like Excel on the web that might connect to the, to the server and just give us a representation of the spreadsheet. So hopefully that makes sense. Performance, we need a lot more bandwidth with fat client because again, we're processing, we're sending a lot of data back and forth versus just sending input and output back. Initial cost is higher, maintenance costs are higher, Ease of development, however, is easier from a fat client. So the idea uh, there is just because development is easier doesn't mean it's what we want to do. We might want to create those web-based interfaces, those web applications, software as a service that would perform well in the aspect of um, utilization of our system and then of course with a thin client if we do it via the web or via a web browser it may very easily become cross-platform so we're not having to like with a thick client we have to make sure a thick client application like quickbooks back in the day would run you got a version for mac and a version for windows whereas now quickbooks online works in a browser will work cross-platform. So it's greatly reducing the cost for third-party developers that are developing software for us to use. 
However, um, they're also going to be storing that data in their data warehouses. That may be okay with you. That may not be okay with you, say, to have your financial information out there. So client server two, tiers, so a tier two design or two tier design. The user interface resides on the client, that being the local computer. All data resides on the server, okay? So, and the application logic can run either on the server or on the client or can be divided between the two. So a lot of times what we see is basic processes done on the client that are quick, large processes, querying of information, et cetera, back on the server. In a three-tier design, the user interface runs on a client and the data is stored on the server, but a middle layer between the client and server processes the client requests and translates them into data access commands. So this would be, an example of this might be if we're going back to a legacy system where we're going to store data, we might have a middleware in this three tier that does more processing, that does specific things uh, that are coming from the client, storing it back on onto the server. So uh, client server designs, you know, here's sort of a graphic of them. You can see in the tier two design, you know, where the shared is versus having an application server. So a database. So if we take the three tier design, we may have a database sitting at Facebook that does, you know, like one of the farm games, for example, um, whereas the application server is what's going to serve the application out. That's what the client's going to interface with. The application server is going to talk and store data, you know, say as you play, play the game or as you store photos on Facebook, et cetera, there might be an application that knows how to do all the things that we can do with photos on Facebook. The raw photos are stored back in the server because they don't need to be stored with the specific processes that we do on the data that's presented to the client. All right, so middleware. Middleware offers an interface to connect software and hardware. That's what we're talking about. Um, again, sometimes, a lot of times we see middleware between um, the database and the output to the client. So the idea is we could create a middleware, uh, for example, that might communicate information with a Windows-based client, might communicate information differently with a Mac client. So depending on the information it receives or the processes it's asked to do, it can store all the information the same back on the database, but it'll present it or process it differently depending on what's on the front end client. So um, it's the slash, yes, in the different client desk server for a three-tier model. It resembles the plumbing system in your house. It connects important objects in a way that requires little, uh, little or little attention is what that should have said. I apologize. All right, so client server, you know, here's like central data processing center. You see we have a server, we have application, we have a user interface, all of that coming over the web, you know, versus central server with remote terminals, this being a uh, mainframe, for example, we have data and data logic back on the mainframe and we have a dumb terminal or a client. Standalone, you can see everything's done on the client. Two tier is gonna use the server and the client. If you notice, the application logic can be split, again, between the client application and the server. And then, of course, a three-tier, three independent. So the idea, of course, is we might get more feature functionality, more speed and performance from a three-tier. We also open up um, the potential for hacking because there's multiple levels now that can be hacked um, you know, versus minimal levels. Just an idea to think about. All right, so let's stop right there and we'll come back and finish with part two. Take care.